uh, of course, the, does, everybody, does everybody here a little bit versed on DJ technology, two turntables and a mixer, or do I have to take a really big step backwards here? <laughs> well, uh, quickly, basic uh, DJ setup that was in any club back then from 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, of course, is your mixer and your two turntables. The mixer being something which enables you to mix the two records together. Uh, what everybody else was doing at that time was just playing a record and then crossfading and mixing into another record. Some people were able to align the beats together, which made them sound very, you know, flawless and you could very, it was hard to tell when things were coming in and out. Uh, but that was about it. In Detroit, I started going, you know, down to the shelter, listening to Derek play. And he would do all these crazy things, uh, what was called uh, EQing, which at that time, an EQ was a way to make your sound sound better by, if your EQ works, by taking certain frequencies out or by accentuating the frequencies, you could, in effect, change the records. Again, at this time, most clubs, most club owners, most parties you went to, the EQ was back here, locked behind some like grating. I remember actually at the shelter sometimes we'd try and take screwdrivers out so we could actually play with it. But luckily, some some bright some, some bright engineer started to release mixers with uh, you know more intricate EQs on them. And this is what Derek was using. So he'd be playing a record and you know taking all these things out, and he'd start using say the very very high parts of one record and the very low parts of another record. So when it came together, it was this new third record that didn't exist, but it was much more than just two records on top of each other. He was starting to pick uh, the frequencies, the, the parts that kind of went together and, and, and complemented each other. And I don't know if that came from him being uh, a producer or just thinking differently, but that was, uh, you know, as, as, as simple as it sounds, that really wasn't happening anywhere else, you know? And uh, I, I started to, you know, notice this as uh, I started to travel more. In around 1990, I started uh, with my partner John Aquaviva, a record label called Plus Eight. And uh, shortly afterwards, we had right, an underground hit, whatever that means, but uh, with Dan Bell and John and I under the name Cybersonic. And uh, suddenly, people wanted a DJ to go over and play this record overseas. They wanted someone from the Plus 8 camp to, you know, kind of play their Detroit, Windsor sound, whatever it was we were doing. And uh, so I, I went over there, I went over to London, and the first thing I noticed was what I'm talking about now, is that no one was EQing. No one was doing anything different. It was just, you know, everyone was into Acid House, everyone was into Detroit Techno, but it was like, it's nearly like playing back, playing, pl playing by numbers. Here's one record, here's another. Here's another record, here's another. And it was, you know, for someone coming from Detroit at that time, growing up, going to the Music Institute, and, you know, in a dark room, and hearing just these, these walls of sound and high frequencies coming out, low frequencies, and these records that I knew, you know, off by heart by then, getting morphed into something completely different, going to London was a little bit of an eye-opener. It was like, man, you guys need to wake up. These guys were, you know, really into techno, really into acid house, but... It was like they were nearly, I'm not dissing anyone over there, well I guess I am, but a lot of the people, it was just like they were regular DJs who had come up through the 70s and 80s playing soul music, which a lot of them were, just playing them back, not really, there was noth nothing really progressive about the way they were playing their music. And I think you know, that's what I got from Derek and those guys, and that kind of point is what's carried on throughout my career. That electronic music, when I heard Derek's records, when I heard Kevin's Wands, all these guys, it was futuristic music. It was, it was alien music. I, there was no way, you know, every time you tried to classify it, it, it kind of moved, it moved ahead again. And as much as the music was like that, I find, uh, and I, I, when I look back, you know, the, the, the mentality of the DJs in every aspect was also that in Detroit. It wasn't, you know, if, if you're making futuristic music, you have to make, you know, you have to perform futuristically. And that's, uh, you know, kind of what I guess I've been trying to do for the last 10 years. Find uh, new ways of performing, whether it's a, a live performance or whether it's a DJ's performance. Find new technologies, old technologies, or wrong technologies to do something different and to 
mark the nights that I play as something really significant and special, kind of like the nights that I remember in my head from the early days in Detroit, or not just Detroit, because I've, you know, I've had great experiences throughout, uh, all over the, uh, I guess all over the world now, but those first points in Detroit, hearing, again, Derek and those guys play, when they were doing these crazy things, it was like, well, they were doing something unlike anybody else, and those are things I'm going to remember for the rest of my life, because they were doing something different, and uh, that's kind of, I think, what the whole mentality of um, Detroit and Detroit Techno has always been for me. So anyway, when I was over in England doing, uh, you know, I, this, uh, doing these gigs and DJing and stuff like that, I remember this one show, which I don't know if I'll use my quote, which Derek wants me to use, <laughs> but I was at, uh, you know, I started to notice how how much an impact you could have by changing these records. I was playing at a club called Saber Sonic, and uh, you know, I was just doing what I normally do around, I guess, around here, and uh, playing two records, you know, dropping the bass out, creating tension, creating anticipation, and uh, you know, suddenly this crowd was just started going completely off, much like the crowds were going off here back then. But uh, you know, the promoter came up to me, and people started coming up to me and saying, "What the hell are you doing?" You know, thought I was crazy. I was, like, you know, doing all this stuff with the EQ, and suddenly there was just a, tss, and everyone's like, "Well, where'd the record go?" But suddenly the crowd was going absolutely ballistic when it kicked back in. Like it was just a, a, an incredible energy rush, and uh, so it, it was just really easy, to, I guess, apparent for me to see that this was the way forward for. Uh, Performance and for for DJing and and, and for my career. Uh, shortly after that, I started to also delve into live shows under the name Plastic Man. This is ninety two, ninety three, and uh, that was a whole, whole, I guess, a whole new ball of wax. What what that entailed was, you know, forget all this the, the DJing equipment. It was like taking my whole studio out on the road. Um, a lot of ways, it was the biggest pain in my ass, you know, carrying all, you know, every, you, uh, people probably see now, you know, the laptop technicians, they take their laptop around and that's all they need, but back then there was no such thing as, you know, Reason or any of these programs that you can do all these sounds on, and it was uh, me by myself with probably, you know, two or three of these huge crates, carrying them around, sending them over to London, doing all these sound checks and stuff, and uh, once everything was going, the potential that I had in front of the, for the crowd was was unbelievable because I had all these special effects, all these things that I had in my studio to do trickery with, new ways to uh, play one of my songs like I don't know, Spastic or a, a one of the early Fuse records, but you know play it in a different way again, and, and and again I just started seeing people recognize what I was doing and then suddenly say, well this isn't exactly like the album version, this isn't exactly like I heard someone else play it. And just saw, you know, that kind of, it's kind of like pulling the rug out of, from people's feet a little bit, giving them something that they know, giving them something which is comfortable, but then kind of twisting it a little bit. And uh, that got me to thinking, well, is there a way that I, I, could, I could have this potential without taking all this stuff around? That was, I was a little bit lazy, too, I think. So, But uh, was, uh, would there be a way of kind of combining the potential of the live show, the equipment of the live show, but have the opportunity to play other people's music a lot with records and kind of cross this idea of, of DJing and, and, and live performance. And that's kind of where the very, very, very first beginnings of uh, what I guess I refer to now as DexFX 909 came about. And uh, I did a number of experiments. Maybe some of you guys were there in, in kind of the early days of, of, of 93, 94, around Detroit, around Toronto, you'd see a, if you came to any of the parties, it was a really strange setup. We had a, there was no actual technology to do what I wanted to do at that point for DJing. Uh, there wasn't any of these fancy mixers with all these, you know, lots of, you know, knobs that do crazy things. So I actually had to use two mixers. So you had something here to play the records. I had this other big thing up.